Hey guys, we're sponsored today by the new Netflix original comedy special, Louis C.K. 2017. Yes, I can't wait to watch this. Apparently, the ad copy says he's exploring his usual misery, and he's going to be talking about the hilarity of life in 2017. So watch Louis C.K. 2017, now streaming only on Netflix. Hey guys, I want to tell you about a great new show from Stitcher called First Day Back. The concept asks a simple question. How does a person return from an event that changes them. So the new season is about a woman who accidentally shot and killed her husband, but has no memory of it. And the show goes into like what happened that night, but it's really about everything that came after that for her. Like what was it like her first day out of prison? How does she readjust to freedom? How is she going to find a job? Will she be able to reconnect with her family? So yeah, how do you come back from the worst thing you've ever done when you don't even remember doing it? First day back, subscribe now on Stitcher, iTunes, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hello, the internet, and welcome to another episode of The Cracked Podcast. My name's Jack O'Brien. I'm the editor-in-chief of Cracked, and this week we're talking about things you take for granted as being authentic or natural that it turns out are either fake or or more recent uh, than you expect. It's like you're walking through the forest and you walk a little off the path and suddenly run directly into a wall that has the rest of the forest just painted onto it. And you look over and there's a carny leaning up against the back of you know, one of those fake stage trees and he's making the bird noises with his mouth. It's exactly like that. But yeah, things that we take for granted that they've just always been there the way they are today. The idea that you smile when you're happy or politely at strangers, that's something I grew up thinking was an automated reflex produced by the human body, but it's actually considered weird outside of America. And if we're being honest, New York, Chicago, and LA think it's weird. People from other countries come here and feel like they're walking around with a bunch of mentally ill people. We smile so much. There's an actual Russian saying that he who smiles is either crazy or an American. And our Russian QA, Tatiana, whispers that to me underneath her breath every time I try to make a joke in a meeting. No, she's a lovely person, as you heard on our Russia episode. A lot of the examples are going to be things we assume have always been the way they are today that are actually fairly recent. The fact you can ask someone for the time and get an objectively true answer. That didn't happen until 1880, to put that in perspective. For the entirety of Abraham Lincoln's lifetime, there was no central standard time. It was just whatever time it said on the person's pocket watch that you were asking. If your city center had a clock tower, that was useful, but then it had to compete with whatever time the next town over thought it was, which caused a whole shitload of problems when trains became a thing, because to send a train safely on a track, you have to know the time where you are, what time it is at the station the train's going to, each junction it was going to pass. If all those places exist on different time frames, that doesn't really work. The main station in Philadelphia once had six clocks up showing six different times. And they didn't even really have to be wrong. The sun passes at its highest point in the sky at a slightly different time. So they had to force a standard time into existence, and they based it all around this town, Greenwich, which was just the first town to, I guess, be like us first over in England, and the rest of the world slowly fell into line and has been complaining about daylight savings time ever since. By the way, Lincoln also never opened a door using a doorknob. Those weren't invented until 1890, I think. He died in 1865. One that I've kind of had a hard time wrapping my head around uh, when thinking about history is nationalism. There was no such thing as Italy when the Italian Renaissance happened. Italy was just a bunch of tiny, warring nation states. Wars back then were like high school football games, except they only happened once a year and all the guys tried to murder each other. But it was about that size in terms of 
the different tribes. You would go over to the next town over and, you know, fight a war with them. So you weren't loyal to a nation. You were loyal to your religion or your cultural group or your city state or clan or tribe. Up until the late 18th, early 19th century, most quote, nations were just a collection of different ethnicities, speaking different languages. Uh, when the French Revolution happened, only 50% of the people in France spoke French, and only 12% spoke it, like, well, conversationally. And yeah, we're still actually fighting that battle to this day, dealing with conflicts between national borders and the actual cultures that get cooped up together in those nations. Anyways, those are three examples I didn't have time to get to, but let's get right into it because we do get to a lot. I'm going to drop in at a couple places to add details or correct myself, so I will talk to you then. We're joined in studio by my occasional co-host, Mr. Michael Swaim. Hi, Michael. Howdy. Welcome to the new Cracked Podcast Studios. Yeah. 10,000 square foot warehouse space. Yeah, it's beautiful. You can hear huh? that echo. <laughs> My car collection is right there yep. out through the. Uh, Stolen window. from Jay Leno, one yeah. piece at a time. <laughs> and we're joined today by Teresa Lee. Hello. I'm yelling Hi. at you from across the hall. <laughs> <laughs> How's the weather over there? Oh, it's terrible. It's yeah. Storming. Jack insisted on a Citizen Kane style dinner table. We're all yeah. at opposite ends of <laughs> It's really creepy. Has its own weather like a uh, <laughs> blimp hanger. I'll just be walking down a runway throughout the entirety of this podcast. <laughs> so just picture all of this in your mind <laughs> okay. as we discuss. I called this fundamental realities of life that were made up by some dude the other day. And I think that's generally what we're going to be talking about. Or a lady. Yeah. Ladies yeah. can make up some bullshit. Guy. Some, What's an old wives' some, tale if not some broad making up some shit? <laughs> some dipshit. <laughs> yeah. Some old it's wife. It's secret magic. Magic is real. Old, what, old, old wives', wives tale, tales? Probably, yeah. Homework. Most of them are based in some sort of... I bet. Well, I just feel like it's oftentimes you hear like, oh, like carrots are good for your eyes, but then it's true. I would believe right. pagan witchcraft mm -hmm. bled into old wives' tales for sure, <laughs> but that's a different podcast. <laughs> like when we first started the site, we had an article debunking that colds are caused by cold, right. but then like now it's like actually come out that because your blood vessels are like closer to your skin and your nose or something, it does leave you more susceptible to infection when it's cold. So, damn. Those old wives. It's crazy how they always I, come back at the end and every know, time know what I, they're talking about. Every time I hear the final word on the calm and cold, I'm like, finally, we know the truth. Right. The truth is out. Yeah. It we'll keeps never flipping. know. It's like egg cholesterol. Right. Egg col oh, yeah, whether it's good or, good or bad for you. Yeah, yeah that, that keeps flipping, and I'm a little annoyed by it. Um, <laughs> But as of right now, I believe that egg yolks are good for you, and I eat five every morning. You do have a big bowl of egg yolks in <laughs> yeah, front of you. Just... <laughs> so, yeah, this is something uh, we, we had a recent article that I think talked about the fact that white people are a cultural construct in the title. I think it was like white people and other things that you take for granted. Seven concepts we totally take for granted, like quote, white people, end quote. White. white. Uh, eggplant emoji. <laughs> yeah. yes. Universal Can we get coffee on that? That shouldn't right. be there. <laughs> <laughs> Should be there. We're, we're going young. We're, we have our, <laughs> we're our we're young going folks. young. It's <laughs> not what you meant by that. I am going to cut that out of context <laughs> okay. and use it as my ringtone. Jack saying, we're going young. <laughs> we're going young with our eggplant emoji. So let's talk about that. It's something that we've covered in a lot of different ways. One of my favorite articles from the past few years is just different things that people wouldn't expect are man-made that are. Like the rainforest was probably built by Native Americans over the course of a millennium. They were just really good at landscaping and sort of changing the direction of rivers. And they were just these incredible landscape architects who like planted all this soil. There's this soil in the Amazon area that is like 20 times more fertile than soil anywhere else in the world. And, and they think it was like broad. And, and it's man-made. It's man-made. Hey guys, real quick, because I was just sort of pulling statistics and details from memory. 
on the uh, Amazon rainforest. So when the Spaniards came to South America, historians and archaeologists now think they were arriving to basically like a meticulously landscaped vast jungle garden. It wasn't obvious because the people had died out a few years before they showed up and things grow fast in the jungle. I don't know if you've seen one of those nature documentaries, but cheetahs will get swallowed by vines if they don't step to it in the Amazon rainforest. And we have the technology now to see that these vanished civilizations were brilliant architects of the earth. They dug out terraces across the mountains of Peru and seeded the Amazon basin with fruit trees that records now suggest sustained like huge populations. They had towns in the Americas in like the 1200s that were bigger than London at that time. There were man-made moats crisscrossing everything, canals, dams, artificial ponds for fishing. Uh, indigenous people in Bolivia managed to divert entire fucking rivers. And that super soil that I was talking about is called Terra Preta, Black Earth in Portuguese. Scientists are still trying to figure out the recipe, but if you go to the article that we're going to link to, you see a side-by-side -side picture of a field of corn planted in the best soil we've come up with so far using our fancy science. And that corn's about uh, shoulder high. There's a guy standing there. And then on the right side is the same guy standing next to some terra preta corn, and it's twice as tall as him. And the stalks of corn appear to be flexing, and they all have massive erections. Anyways, I made up the stat that it's 10 or 20 times as powerful as our soil. I don't know how you would even calculate that, but it's just way more powerful. The mathematical principle of way more. The reason I was remembering the number 10 was because Terra Preta was believed to have covered at least 10% of the Amazon basin, which is equivalent to an area the size of France. So when I tell you they fucked with the landscape in creative ways, that's what I mean. I've mentioned this before, but there's a period in Europe called the Little Ice Age where for a couple summers in a row, summer just never came. It was like snowing in June, millions of people died. It was pretty, pretty ugly. And there's a Stanford scientist who now thinks the reason that this happened was because of basically reverse global warming caused by all the Native Americans on the other side of the earth, basically dying from smallpox all at once because they killed so many trees when they were alive with these like controlled burns that when they all died, so many trees grew back that they like drank up all the CO2 out of the air. And you had like a couple years of the opposite of what we're about to start experiencing. Yeah, get your board shorts on, man. We're all fucked. Uh, all right, good thing they were the ones who died and not the Europeans. We're doing awesome. Back to the episode. Wow. Yeah. So they're just like, whoa. They're like so, shitting all over Johnny Appleseed. Right. Like exactly. That. We like, made the apple rainforest. Apple trees, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> we made, we animals, built though? a rainforest. Did those animals all come in after? I think I think it must have. <laughs> I think there must have been a <laughs> where, lot of flora and fauna. No, they were just in, hanging out with, in an open desert. <laughs> Native Americans it brought giant sloths <laughs> over in a birch bark canoe, Carried and them. were like, "You're your home now." Sculpted them from, <laughs> and another thing from that that we might as well talk about <laughs> is a uh, food. Like just how many of our foods, like fruits and vegetables, started out looking nothing like they do today. Like when I when I think back to Adam and Eve in, in the Garden of Eden, yeah. something that totally happened. You well, know, Whether it the, did or not, the person who wrote the story down in the Bible, when they wrote the word apple, they pictured an apple they were familiar with. Right. And it's right. nothing like what you Has, think an apple yeah, is. Yeah, the apple that you just pictured when we said apple probably doesn't even really look like the apple that your great-grandparents knew, but it definitely is a American invention, the, I'm the apple. I'm uh, picturing iPhone yeah. That's, yeah, that's yeah. what comes to mind first when you hear Apple. Yeah. See, I told you, we're going young. I'm we just, got the young ones. I'm just seeing like a big, long line of douchebags. <laughs> <laughs> the banana started out a few hundred years ago and like looked nothing like it does today. It was basically like a pod of seeds and just through amazing horticulture. And again, it's the Native Americans doing an amazing job of like, creating all these different fruits. The tomato was an American invention, potatoes. 
all these things that we associate with other yeah. cultures and other countries. The potato was countries. invented in America? Thought it was. I might have that wrong. I always think of Ireland when I think of potatoes. I know. Me too. But I guess they didn't Most have vegetables. The whole thing is that they yeah. didn't have it, right? That's the, the, the family. Corn. Right. You should think of I a lack of, think of, a lack think of, of potatoes. dearth of potatoes when right. you think of Ireland. <laughs> I might be thinking about corn, which was invented in America. You, usually you always are. get those two yeah. mixed up. Well, <laughs> I'll say the most mind blowing way to experience this. What really drove it home for me is you can find pictures or at least diagrams when pictures don't exist. Do go Google image search like what? original Apple. I mean, you'll get an <laughs> iPhone one. But if you do the work, you can find pictures of like, oh, that's what an apple looked like in 1650. And it, it's crazy. What it's, is, is it smaller? Because I've seen crab apples. I mean, apples. it's crawling around. Is it's it, got <laughs> eye stalks. It's got eyes. <laughs> That's what I love. Yeah, your average like ear of corn literally has like 16 corn kernels huddling for space right. on the ear of corn. <laughs> it's astounding that there was enough food yield to, for anyone to survive. Off of any of this crap, you look at it by our standards, you're like, that banana has like 1% banana meat. How'd they eat that? It's just giant it seeds just took in stuffed seeds. in a wrapper. Yeah. Well, it took incredible imagination for them to like see what we have today and be like, no, this could be something. And like a lot of persistence and just being really good at technology with gonna, technology yeah. being like it's incredible nature. technological advancement that we don't recognize as such because it's all like interfacing with dirt and plants <laughs> exactly but it's inc that takes so much scientific knowledge to do all that there's this one plant called wild mustard that cauliflower broccoli cabbage kale basically all the really healthy foods they all come from a plant called wild mustard that just looks like a weed that you would see. Which is interesting, especially because I certainly don't know, but I also think even the leading nutritionists of the world don't know all the perfect ins and outs of nutrition, right? That's constantly an ongoing like field of scientific inquiry. So I wonder if like that ancient corn, though it's way more inconvenient, I wonder how it stacks up nutritionally or if it was like yeah. way better, healthier than... Yeah, I don't know. I don't I'm know. cynical, so my first gut instinct is like, well, if we changed it, we probably screwed it up somehow. <laughs> Hey, real quick, broccoli is the suppression of flower development in the wild mustard plant. Cauliflower is caused by making the flower sterile, poor cauliflower. Kale is caused by the enlargement of leaves. And cabbage is the suppression of the internode length, obviously. All the same plant, just with different features. Emphasized and de-emphasized broccoli was invented in the 6th century BC. I don't know when the acronym GMO was invented, but I bet it was less than 8,000 years ago. Corn was invented by Native Americans 10,000 years ago. The banana was domesticated in New Guinea 6,500 years ago. I was wrong. I think I said that it was Native Americans. Apples in the form that we know them today as edible and anything besides bitter crab apples for making booze and vinegar uh, is mostly thanks to... European American settlers, I think. Johnny Appleseed was a real dude. So there you go, Western European Americans. We made apples better, atta boy. I was right about the potato though. The Inca Indians in Peru cultivated it 8,000 to 5,000 years BC. The Spanish conquistadors brought it back to Europe for my ancestors to fucking eat like crazy, you guys and then suddenly not eat like crazy. Okay, back to the episode. Well, sometimes we add, like, I know like milk is one of those things that they say is good for us, but a lot of the- um, Sometimes. Yeah, well then now, now we all know that it's not, but a lot of the nutrients, aren't they added? Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know that. that it is or it's not. To me, that's like the egg thing. It goes back and forth. <laughs> like milk is obviously partly good for you and partly bad for you, but who knows how much? It does, seems like an ongoing question. Milk always struck me as like, well, we have these cows here because we like steak, and so we might as well figure out like a way to get this milk monetize. delicious. Yeah, yeah, let's monetize. Let's more monetize parts of that the cow. stuff that comes out of out of that cow's udders. Dairy is not is not good for us, and we shouldn't have much of it in our diet. There's pretty good historical evidence for that. Like the one time that America's heart disease actually dipped in the entire history of the United States was during World War II because we had a dairy ration uh. on. So they were like, oh, well, weird. And then they have just like crammed everything full of cheese ever since. Though. Do you think they had uh, speakeasies but for milk? 
Yeah, <laughs> I think they do they in uh, a, clock, a clockwork orange, so <laughs> right, yeah. probably. Those are not nutrients they're piping in. <laughs> <laughs> and then a lot of domestic animals, obviously, because we kept talking about how dogs are the touchstone for a lot of these plant things. But chickens used to be half the size that they are today. Cows basically didn't exist. Cows used to be giant, scary, aggressive things. <laughs> and they cows are basically too their ancestor, which isn't around anymore, what dogs are to wolves. Oh. Is it the Arak or something? Yeah, they, yeah, yeah the I think that's cow. right. Yeah, and they, they basically bred the docile ones together yeah. Yeah, <laughs> until they got these ones that would stop killing people yeah. every time they tried to, to milk them. I wonder if it works the same as dogs, because what's so interesting about dogs is the way that that friendliness and loyalty we associate with dogs, what they're really breeding for is delayed puberty. So like oh. a dog is a wolf that never fully matures. That's why it never develops all like its killer instinct. That's why a dog's always friendly. It's basically like an arrested development version of a wolf that always stayed young and cheerful. A puppy, yeah. I wonder if like cows are also similarly <laughs> stunted. Yeah. Mentally. It's a process of like exaggerating or stunting different things right. in the yeah. genome. Like that's how they describe like broccoli is the wild Just mustard plant with mustard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> with with the flowering exaggerated and like some other part of it stunted, essentially. You know, there's a, a huge amount of backlash against genetically modified foods, which I'm not gonna sit here and be like we should trust corporations. There's nothing, <laughs> they're not doing anything wrong. But, you know, I think when we think about genetically modified food, we're picturing some natural state of food, like as God intended, as it was when we found the earth. <laughs> and it's like not, none of these things existed. These You're already are all way past man made. Yeah. Everything was rocks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they, they just. They just bred rocks together. Did you know until apples they... used to be rocks? Yeah. <laughs> well, you also, in the article, um, it mentions beaches, too, which is sort of, the, the beaches used to be the scary thing where people went to die, or, you know, ship, yeah. <laughs> ships would crash. It's mostly rocks, and now, you know, we think of sandy, luxurious beaches. Um, Even though still the majority of beaches or coastline around the world is still a place you would not go on vacation. Right. Yeah, I think it's like, it's interesting, like the collective unconscious Mm -hmm. Like most people now, if you say beach, would not think, ah, oh, the craggy cliffs of Dover where a <laughs> ship might find its rat, wreck and ruin. <laughs> because we all live, we don't live that life anymore. When we go to the beach, it's you do we say chose that to go to the yeah. beach. Yeah. You do yeah. say that every time I ask <laughs> no. you if you want to go to the beach. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Weirdly. Ah, the <laughs> I get out these little toy boats and we have a blast. <laughs> so, Teresa, you pointed this out yesterday that there's like two types of entries on this list. There are the things that are more physical things that are man-made that we think of as natural, like just having always existed. And then there are these like concepts that we sort of take for granted. And yeah, the beach one's interesting because prior to, I think it was like mostly the 20th century, people just thought of the beach as like a dangerous place that you like, <laughs> they're like, oh, the ocean's fucking terrifying, man. Like going towards the water without a giant ship around you, what are you crazy? Mm -hmm. It's um, kind of like the woods now. We still think of the woods that way, right? Like, don't go into the woods. Totally. Maybe, right, like, yeah. hundreds of years from now, the woods is going to be, like, the most relaxing place. <laughs> yeah. And what are, like, the huge ocean-related books? That, what do you read? Moby oh, Dick. Yeah. You're reading 20,000 mm -hmm. Leagues Under the Sea. Like, it's even the fiction makes it. The ocean is, like, space travel now. You're like, yeah. the ocean is where professionals have to go to explore because it's so freaking dangerous. With your giant whales and whatnot. Yeah, <laughs> always giant whales. You know, those whales used to be giant. like the size of your fist before right. we, were, we <laughs> yeah. bred them. No, that's we bred whales too. No proof of that. <laughs> no, we probably just killed all the big ones. An interesting thing about how that idea came about, the idea that like beaches were a cool thing to do, is that it was like during the Industrial Revolution and like the working class man suddenly like became hot on the street. Like the rich people were like, well, they seem to live longer than us. Let's do what they do. And so that's like how that trend started is that like poor people like would go swimming in the ocean, I guess, because fuck, they didn't have anything better to do. And so rich people started imitating them. The real reason that working class people were living longer was because they actually lived 
active lives because they had to mm-hmm. for a living and the rich people were like sitting back with their like swollen like calves and ankles from gout being yeah. like why like snorting was it snuff or whatever? yeah yes yeah, sn- just, a lot of- just snuffing up big piles of tobacco <laughs> up their nostrils being like well i guess we have to dip our bodies into the ocean that's, that's what makes these people live longer and look better than us but It's interesting how the different classes drive things forward and backward because lobster is is an interesting, Mm -hmm. like as a food, our relationship to lobster has changed a lot and a lot in relation to high class versus low class, right? For all the people like me who fear this, I just first want to verify that, yes, they're closely related to bugs. It's an ocean (laughs) bug. It's it's You're eating an insect Mm -hmm. or like... More closely related than I want. But yeah, so here's a pull quote from uh, one of the articles I found on it. In terms of status, the lobster has come a long way. Homerus Americanus, or the main lobster, which really sounds like American Homer, doesn't it? Yeah. (laughs) Um, Ascended from humble fare to fodder fit for royal banquets in a relatively short 100 years, a true success story. Prior to the 19th century, only widows, orphans, and servants (laughs) were allowed to eat lobster. (laughs) So I like your husband (laughs) died. Here's an ocean bug. (laughs) Feel better. And in some parts of New England, serving lobster to prison inmates more than once a week was forbidden by law as it was considered cruel and unusual punishment under the Constitution. Yeah, it'd be like if we, if we made prisoners eat bugs today. It's Snowpiercer. The yeah. prisoners were doing class action suits of like, you know, they just feed us these bars made of crunched up bug meat. And we're right. like, yes, it's a fine delicacy <laughs> called lobster. But basically what happened uh, is... When railroad culture started taking over, and there were all these people who traveled to Maine but didn't live in Maine, they would serve lobster and steak on the train, this is like the invention of surf and turf, to get them to equate lobster, which they could get incredibly cheaply because everyone hated it with steak and think it was of equal value and literally like the porters on the trains would say oh yeah lobster's a delicacy everyone loves lobster and it was like a way for the shore town to cheat tourists basically (laughs) to be like here eat this crappy food that we don't eat you fucking rubes (laughs) yeah that our prisoners eat what's funny is because I don't eat lobster but a bunch of people tell me it's delicious all the people ate it and even the people who later found out that it was like a trash food were like I don't care. It's really good. Yeah. And it just became popular after that. I but th- really recent, like less than 150 years ago, people would be like, lobster, <laughs> what do you think? I'm some kind of orphan widow? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How dare you? You think my parents and my husband have died? Yeah. <laughs> Such a specific. Uh... <laughs> Serve it to the criminals. <laughs> That's like the same trajectory as Diamond Rings as well, Mm. which I think we've covered, so you don't have to like spend a lot of time on it. But the first thing we know about engaging with a ring was the ancient Egyptians, who would literally just do a reed in a circle. So, I mean, that's not three months' salary. That's like 30 (laughs) seconds. Two months. Yeah, exactly. I guess if you're a surf building the pyramids, maybe. But then that advanced in Roman times to an iron ring, which literally symbolized legal ownership over the woman that the ring is on. (laughs) And then in like 1947, the De Beers Corporation coined the phrase, a diamond is forever, convinced one generation successfully that diamond rings are how you get engaged. And now it's like, boom, it's locked in. It's a done deal. You only have to get one generation of people (laughs) and then it's locked in. Like I feel like God Milk... Yeah. That campaign did literally did so much for dairy. You're saying it's bad that it did, but <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all those anti-smoking ads, man. Oh yeah. Exactly. Well, I no, th- I mean that's actually. I think they thing. did kind of work on. <laughs> they did work. They worked folks. in a way where it was. I mean, it's. I think yeah. With that, it's like they're exaggerating, and I'm sure it's obviously smoking right. bad for you. But it Teresa's scared, smoking right now. It, <laughs> it scared the shit out of me when and I was. She looks so cool. I've got to <laughs> tell you so guys. Cool. Yeah. I used to be so scared, like in a terrified way of drugs. Like if I saw someone smoking at a park, I would freak the fuck out. And now it's just like, oh, it's just make an informed choice. Right. About I don't smoke, but it's like it's not that scary. I don't know. Just make an informed choice. Yeah, Yeah, you're chaining cigarettes right in front of (laughs) me right now. I don't know. It's just Uh, to get into that headspace. (laughs) But it's just like how uh, it's the same thing with the NFL where I don't know what you, but it was like less than 180 years ago that the NFL came into existence. Not even. I think it's much less than that. 
But even uh, to me, even 100 years ago is like not that long ago. But yeah. if you can get one generation of folks to take it for granted, I would have assumed that the NF that like football in America goes back to the so 1600s. Native Americans, no. Absolutely does not. <laughs> Had like recent invention, very popular ad campaign, supplanted it in the American culture, and it's just there now. Yeah. The NFL? I mean, the NFL is very recent. Yeah, I mean, there was like Pop Warner and like not. Pro, or is it specific? Maybe it's the Super Bowl. That I I'm did thinking Pop Warner. It might be. <laughs> it might be the Super Bowl specifically, and also like NFL's like central place in our culture. I think goes back only to the '80s. Like that's what I mean. Like I think it has game. to it be around TV. It, it I, rivals I imagine, baseball, I think, in our consciousness. But I imagine it has to because baseball. There's a lot of baseball on the radio, right? But I imagine with NFL, it kind of became bigger with TV. I don't know. We'd have to look into the stats. I think the big sports back when like people listened on radio were baseball, baseball. and boxing and yeah. horse racing. Hoop and stick. Because right. it's not really a fast pace. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine listening to football on the radio. Yeah, football is definitely like tailor made for television, mm -hmm. especially like high definition HD. Because you can't really tell them apart otherwise, because everybody's got helmets on and. Um, Jack's very sad about football, <laughs> the state of TV football. The diamond thing is really interesting to me because that's one of the things that I know. Like, I've heard that before, and I know it's created. And the diamonds used to just be in mines. You can pick them up, and then took them all, put them in a vault. And so I know all that, but even knowing all that, I still think of a diamond as this expensive luxury. Yeah. I, well, yeah, I'm aware right. of the truth, but I also, at the same time, feel that way about diamonds. If somebody gave me a diamond necklace, I would 100% be like, oh, this is a... Very expensive, big gesture. Even and it is because everyone chooses it to be so it is. Right. So you like know we it's all fake, buy, we all like buy into it's also it, even real. though we are right. aware. Yeah. It's, it's a weird... Well, De Beers, I mean, the other thing they did is, yeah, they bought all the diamonds. They and, put them in a vault. And all the diamond mines. Right. And so, yeah, they can create an artificial scarcity because they have an actual monopoly and they're just incorporated in places where monopolies aren't illegal and then they right. just like sell them off in small amounts to america where monopolies are illegal but for all intents and purposes they are expensive they're incredibly valuable and i mean they look valuable as shiny. as a no, species see, we like shiny things yeah but i there are other <laughs> pieces of glass and rock that look just as pretty for one one hundredth of the yeah. cost that's what Hope That's my girlfriend's true. not listening. Those what's like the geo <laughs> geode things that you used to play with right? as a kid? Yeah. yeah. What's wrong Those with cool, a geo? Those cool, but they're like a dollar. Yeah. Put uh, one of those on a ring. That'd be a heavy ring. Yeah. Propose it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the uh, the first diamond ring on record was in 1477. Archduke Maximilian of Austria commissioned it. So I also love that like it was literally invented to be like only royal family can afford this shit. Like. No one was expected to buy a diamond ring except the king. <laughs> and now anyone to further their relationship has to factor in how to buy this expensive rock <laughs> before like, they can invest in whatever they want to do, like get a house or whatever. Well, it's just like all the successful ad campaigns in our modern world. You get the royalty and associate it with like the famous person the same way that Pepsi is so successful in their ads where they get a Jenner and <laughs> they, you know, have have her holding their product and, and it's it totally just a huge works. Yeah, it's right. a huge Everyone success. Everyone yeah. applauds and loves it. Yeah. Yeah. That actually used to be their uh, motto was Pepsi the choice of a gen of a, oh, of a yeah. new generation. generation. I yeah. like those when when Britney was the face of Pepsi. I like those ads. It was just her yeah. singing an original song and dancing around and then it would be like Pepsi. They were on a nice roll from like MJ to Madonna oh, yeah. to Britney and then like something happened and like they just lost their fucking minds. Yeah. I linked on Twitter to uh, these leaked internal documents oh, from no. the Pepsi marketing team about the redesign of the Pepsi logo and it's just the craziest shit you've ever heard. They're just like... They have, like, all these charts with, like, arrows pointing <laughs> forward, and it's, like, millennial. Oh, no. And then, like, DNA. And what? then, like, like Pepsi. Yeah. <laughs> any, any... Future? Put them in... Any yeah. behind-the-scenes look at a huge company's oh. logo design is fucking bonkers. Like, oh, yeah. It's always so entertaining, because you will find people being paid an obscene amount to just basically do a fancy version of Doodle 30 things in their mm -hmm. notebook, and then explain... 
as smartly as they can why you paid them that money. So they're like, the arrow represents nextness and the concept right. of leveling through to the generation that comes after you. You're like, yeah, I like the arrow. It's good. <laughs> yeah, FedEx man, has a logo. Great. <laughs> Guys, razors are a lot like diamonds, uh, for one thing. They're the only two objects sharp enough to cut the hairs on my face. But also because razors, like diamonds, have been controlled for decades by one big company relentlessly increasing prices on a product they control the supply of. Shots fired, unnamed razor company. That was until Jeff and Andy, who are just two ordinary guys, doesn't get more ordinary than the names Jeff and Andy, uh, got fed up, like we all are, with being ripped off and started Harry's to fix shaving. And Harry's is so confident about the quality of their blades, they want you to try their trial set for free. Uh, you just have to pay $3 for shipping. It comes with a weighted ergonomic razor handle, a five-blade cartridge with a lubricating strip and trimmer blade, rich lathering shave gel, and a travel blade cover. To redeem your free trial, just go to harrys.com slash cracked. Once again, go to harrys.com slash cracked to get your free trial set. All you have to do is pay $3 for shipping. That's awesome. Thanks, Harrys. Hey, guys, if the spring has you feeling a little more hot and bothered than usual, check out Adam and Eve, your one-stop shop for erotic toys, whether you're a male or a female, straight or gay, or anywhere in between. Adam and Eve has the adult toys and movies you've been looking for. Oh, and here's a really cool thing they do, now that the orange one is coming after your browsing history. On top of having everything you could possibly want from a sex store, Adam and Eve makes your privacy a top priority. They use state-of-the-art encryption to protect your credit card information, send out your packages in plain, anonymous packaging. Also, Adam and Eve will never appear on your billing statement. So go to adamandeve.com. For a limited time only, you get 50% off just about any one item. And that's not all. If you use the promo code CRACKED, C-R-A-C-K-E-D, you'll also get three free adult DVDs and a free mystery gift. So once again, check out adamandeve.com and enter coupon code CRACKED to get 50% off any one item. And when you do, you'll get three free DVDs, a free extra gift, and free shipping too. That's a good deal, you guys. That's adamandeve.com and use code CRACKED at checkout. And speaking of uh, incredibly successful ad impacts and sugar water, I think one of the greatest coups of our lifetimes and our parents' lifetimes is that Coca-Cola has somehow associated sugar water with the feeling of like hope and love. <gasps> like, yeah. They're and so and refresh. And they're so consistent that that must be conscious and it must have been a maintained mission over decades and different staffs. It's just incredible to me that they doubled down on like our sugar water equals America and love and hope. Couldn't it just be Coca-Cola? It tastes good because it's <laughs> sugar and water. Right. No. It's, no, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's so effective that when I see a Coke commercial, I will get thirsty, even if I wasn't thirsty before. Yeah. I'll just start spontaneously dancing with everyone around <laughs> me in the intersection in the big, like... I wonder if they have, like, a board in the coke front office where it's Almost like certainly. nostalgia <laughs> love and they're like okay we've got that we've got nostalgia yeah. now because like christmas is all about nostalgia they've nailed oh. that <laughs> they're like people's childhoods we own them people's desire to do cocaine diet coke <laughs> has that like <laughs> because their most recent diet coke campaign oh, is yeah, just is that basically was straight like, up marketing to yeah to, it's just <laughs> they're marketing it as cocaine they're like have a person like getting ready to go out for the night and they're like listen to techno music because they drank a diet coke and while that. drinking a diet coke but it's just like they're very particularly yeah. designed i will say i slightly prefer the new trend of making your ad fucking crazy and <laughs> nonsensical to get my attention versus the old trend of trying to capitalize on deep human feelings <laughs> that like dignity and nobility because it felt too calculated it was it's just so like... i mean it just yeah i think we're almost we've become such a pop culture immersed world and the audience is so savvy like we yeah. talk about all the time on this podcast you can have a trailer that just references other trailers using musical cues right. and people will understand what you're talking about you couldn't do that 100 years ago i think we all sort of will or a, a large block of us won't stand for you to conflate your product with love 
It le- you know, okay. if it's like Swiffer, we'll be like, fuck you. But we but will, everybody loves but like I, Terry Crews doing something weird and then saying bye Swiffer. I, I feel like though when they try too hard, it feels like it's like, oh, you're like your strings are showing and the audience just gets. I, I think it's funny to see that because then I just imagine the old men sitting in the boardroom trying so hard yeah. and you never get to see that. So it's almost like the, you know, the Wizard of Oz is breaking down. And I like that. I mean, I, I don't want to buy this stuff. I just think it's funny right. to watch it them makes fail. Them, it makes you hate the <laughs> brand like, a little look bit. look how oh, much yeah. money they spent just to... Some of those commercials you can definitely see like a very old man. Yeah, it's like your mask is melting. the old Spice commercial that like... is clever and innovative and go like, I guess kids like weird stuff. <laughs> Make it weird. Yeah. yeah. I feel like those are the Dr. Pepper commercials with like oh, the yeah. little yeah. guy who's like. It's like, this is your concept of what kids think right. is weird yeah. and mimetic, but it's not that. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the Pepsi ad, I think, gave you such a clear idea of like all the marketing buzzwords that were uh-huh. being used. It was just like so transparent, and the things they were trying to capitalize on were just like so ill advised. Do you think um, advertising would fall into this category of things that we take for granted? Well, I was going to say, Michael was saying that he doesn't like the ads that sort of play to basic human desires. But like, for some reason, we let Coke get away with that. And when I was a kid, I preferred Pepsi, which is like not a thing you hear Uh, ever. I absolutely do. Did you go to Taco Bell a lot? Because McDonald's had Coke and Taco Bell had Pepsi. I didn't go to Taco Bell until I was like in my teens, but I just liked Pepsi because it had more sugar. I think it's like mm. sweeter. It tastes better. It doesn't hurt your teeth. It wins in blind taste tests every time. <laughs> but Pepsi. <laughs> but now like Pepsi, just because of marketing, because they lost their way with like their marketing message and Coke just stayed consistent to uh-huh. this, these like really core human things. Now it seems like almost insane that Pepsi would ever like be anything but like a, a distant second to Coke because Coke stayed true to its brand message. Or I, I don't fucking know, but like other it, than the new Coke debacle, which like double backfired, right. where it actually spiked everyone's interest in Coke. In Coke Classic, they, yeah, yeah, they took it away for a few months and were like, "Do you miss it? All right, here's Coke." Wait, back. I don't know about this. Coke stopped. Well, they made a new formula that they called oh. New Coke and uh, let Bill Cosby show for them. Many bad decisions in retrospect, (laughs) but they did all their normal like lab testing and over and over people in blind taste tests liked the taste of new Coke better. So they're like, we got a big hit on our hands and they released it and they immediately became like fanatically like people (laughs) hoarding vaults of classic Coke and then they gave up on it and went back to Coke Classic and saw like a huge spike in Coke, (laughs) way more than they were selling before. Just by misguidedly, or as conspiracy theorists say, they knew what they were doing, but like right. taking it away for six oh, yeah. months and it's then a giving scarcity it back. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah you exactly. Get scared it's going to go away. They just accidentally created a scarcity. Right. They accidentally did what De Beers did. What they didn't realize purpose. is people don't care about the minor improvement in taste. They want it to taste exactly like they're used like to it tasting. Childhood. Exactly. I wasn't allowed to drink a lot of soda when I was a kid, so I could only have it when we had pizza. So I always equate pizza and Coke. Like yeah. we, if we got pizza, I was like, I'm yeah. gonna get Coke. What, what like, a great <laughs> way to what a great way to make a kid just fucking love pizza. pizza yeah. Soda, to be yeah. Like, yeah, you only get this one awesome yeah. thing if you are getting this other awesome thing. I only got chocolate cake when I went on roller coasters. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> A couple other things that I had sort of taken for granted is not necessarily always being around, but having like some sort of authentic roots in our culture. So there there was this big controversy when I was younger and other people were younger too, probably, with <laughs> the Ten Commandment tablets that were outside of like state capitol buildings and state courthouses. An atheist objected to those being there because it's supposed to, you know, we're supposed to have separation of church and state. And the case went all the way to the Supreme Court. So those tablets were actually put in there in the 1950s as part of a PR stunt because the movie The Ten Commandments with <laughs> Charlton Heston was what? coming out. I thought you were going to say Coke had something. Yeah. <laughs> Coke was like, this will get them drinking. Like, there, <laughs> there's actually, like, pictures you can see of Charlton Heston as those things are being put in, being there as Giving part of the PR. Yeah, whatever, being yeah. like, come see my movie. So you're saying Hollywood 
elitists have been running Washington since the very yeah beginning. Hollywood elitists have been yeah like well putting... he was and the people even had more control in the studio system back then this is a director who is so famous and powerful that he coined a popular phrase I'm ready for my close-up Mr. <laughs> DeMille like right. he was synonymous with the concept of being a director at the time <laughs> wait wasn't that from Sunset Boulevard yeah 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 oh, but that okay. became like yeah, yeah. a popular spin-off phrase for after that movie yeah I just mean if people have never heard that name He's definitely of oh, yeah. Spielberg well, level award. importance in his era. Yeah. Do we want to talk about teenagers? I think we're going to end up talking about the white race for oh, yeah. <laughs> for like an hour. The teenagers thing is interesting. That that it's a it was it didn't exist, right? It was children and then adults and then a yeah, li- life magazine. Yeah. People Basically, went immediately were, from twelve to eighteen. <laughs> yeah, people went from, like literally people went from twelve to okay, <laughs> you're working in. age. They had like, time travel figured out. Yeah. yeah. No, but the but, idea like, you got married young, so like you kind of just like jumped right from being in school to being an adult. And it's also why the culture was more buttoned down and grown up because if you think about it, you were a child, so you were like less than, and then you jumped right to being an adult, which you were a younger adult. So you look up to the people with like more experience. There was not this like in-between group of young consumers that were like setting all the trends and stuff. They just like didn't have that. And then, this 1940s article from the magazine Life. It's incredible. Like I'm looking at the first page and they have teen-age girls is, <laughs> is the name of the article. They're like, they're teen-aged, sure. Yeah, yeah. Like they're yeah. inventing that word in this headline. And then like they are like these crazy girls. They talk about them like loving to talk on the phone. <laughs> wearing tight sweaters. Oh, and yeah, that like, picture's yeah. so creepy. It's I just know. like a picture of a teenager in a tight sweater. Yeah, and it's and like, like tight sweater tight. is the worst breach of etiquette. Here, Dorothy Worley, who knows better, poses oh, to no. illustrate. It's like, what? So oh, you're being so like, judgy? They're saying that was a girl who was nice enough to be like, okay, it's against what I believe, but I'll put on a tight right. sweater to illustrate this point <laughs> for the article. Yeah, there's another picture. <laughs> there's another picture of a one of these teen aged girls Pat Woodruff does homework. Who does not know better. With radio <laughs> going full blast. And it's a girl like doing homework next to a radio with her head yeah. like pressed into the radio. I love that. Yeah. That used to be the bad, troublesome kid yeah. was right. doing their homework. homework. <laughs> right. It's, actually, that's a, that image of like having your music loud did stick with me because I it's funny reading about this now because I feel like the idea of teenagers does really only exist in media the way that we know it. Because when I was in middle school, or preteen, I would see these movies and think, this is how it's going to be when I'm a teenager. I'm going to, you know, walk through high school hallways and try to be the cool kid, you know, like blow kisses at the cute boys. Like <laughs> That's what I thought it was. And I thought, you know, you have to talk on the phone and play your music loud. And so I would start to do that because I wanted to be a teenager. So I'd turn my music loud in my room so my mom could hear. And your friends are like, I can't hear you. Turn your music <laughs> yeah. down. But then, well, well, then I hit high school and then, you know, people aren't like that. Nobody is doing the, you know, hallway walk. Everyone on the starts lockers. to individuate into yeah, like a just, real person. You just chill like, out. Oh. Uh, so you kind, of, <laughs> you kind of do it before you're teenagers because you think that's what it's going to be. And then you yeah. become a teenager and then you're like, nobody does this. <laughs> yeah. But even the concept, I guess, of you're going to have a period where we start to give you responsibilities in society, but you're still protected. Right. Then you're let loose didn't exist right so that's the that's the thing we invented is like the learner permit phase of your life yeah exactly it used to yeah. be you turned 14 okay i hope you were paying attention because we have no yeah. more help to give you right well you know like having bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs and quinceaneras and all the other teenage to adult ceremonies usually happen in your teenage years but traditionally they're meant to welcome you into adulthood. Right. Like the minute you turn 13 and have your bar mitzvah, you're and the mitzvahs are supposed 13, to be, right? Yeah, you're supposed to be an adult. Like, now so, you pull your it. weight around here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Welcome. Now you bring a paycheck. Whereas now I think a lot of people do feel that 13 is the very beginning of mm-hmm. their teenage phase. Right. Like not at all that they're an adult I yet. Think they have learner, five more years to chill out. I think learner's <laughs> permit is a great way to put it because you get all the advantages of having society trust you to be an adult, but like none of the shitty responsibility parts of like one reason is because we don't have kids at that time that that was one thing that changed since history 
they used to just immediately get married and have kids and that tends to put a damper on all those fun times like you need to mature real quick yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean you're gonna have to kick your kid out of the house in a scant 13 years <laughs> i know can't wait Oh, I meant the person in the story. You meant oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> you meant you, Jack. Yeah. Can't wait to Can't kick wait your kid to out. Can't wait to get that kid out Great. of the house. Uh, <laughs> I wondered what that 18-year countdown clock above your desk was when you announced the birth. Yep. You just started a clock that would count it down. Yeah. Till we get a extra extra back to hoe in the, in the yard, you know? I wonder if that's why, because now... Modern day, there's sort of this very annoying trend of being like calling it adulting when you're an adult and sort of doing classes. It's like, you know, there's like adult coloring books, there's like adult gymnastics, things that you're supposed to do as a child. I wonder if there's some sort of like ripple effect from us putting so much stress on the importance of teenage years that now people are sort of not even hitting that adult. Like we had this celebrating your adulthood ceremony, yeah. but then you got to keep being a teenager. So there was never a line to jump. Unless, of course, you have a kid, then that's sort of a very clear line. But if you don't have a kid and you're right. 35, everyone's life journey. You never obviously. felt like you jumped over that adulthood line. Right. Some people still grow up at age 12. But um, <laughs> the most interesting, mind blowing thing I read about that ever was. And it's great because we already talked about it, the domestication of animals being a process of extending the childhood period. Mm -hmm. I read a really great paper where they, their basic thesis is that humans are domesticating themselves. And yeah. that's why we see an increase in, a general increase in empathy and decrease in like insane violence, the kind of which that like it would be hard for us to fathom. Like we still obviously have lots of soldiers, but back in the day, Everyone in the town at some point in their life speared someone's guts, oh like, or they died that way, you know, and that's just not true of the mass of a population. And part of that self domestication process of like civilizing humanity is an extension of childhood. So that totally, I didn't hear this new part though. Like, you're right, the adulting trend totally fits into that. Like, now that we've carved out this niche where you're allowed to be a teenager and we have the luxury of being safe that long, we're trying to push it even yeah. further. Well, we treat ourselves like children. Like, I, my sister gave me these, like, Groupon classes. So we took one yesterday, like, at a, one of those aerial warehouse places. Mm -hmm. And the class before us was an adult tumbling class. And just watching them, it just seems so ridiculous. It was this, you know, adult teacher and adult students and like they're all rolling around they, and they're all like fun. level <laughs> one and the way she talked to them was like children she was like oh very good great job okay now let's try this and it made me yeah. realize like i think we just are all trying to go back to this place so we don't have to move forward it's very bizarre i don't know <laughs> i don't know that it's bad it's like, not necessarily, i think the yeah. impulses of childhood are generally healthy good ones but then there's a lack of responsibility a little bit there is if there is, but I don't know. I know people who have their whimsy but also can turn it off and be That's true. mature right. when the – I wonder. So, yeah, but I do think there's a historical trend of us kind of domesticating ourselves. I don't know if it's good or bad. Yeah, I wonder. The, the <laughs> thing you said about dying by spear is interesting because it made me realize, like, when we – hear about a death in our society, it's inherently bad, right? It's a tragedy mm -hmm. usually, which is good. I, I don't think we should be celebrating death. <laughs> but it is interesting to see that contrast. If it used to be just a normal thing, people were always dying. If somebody died, it was like, somebody died. Okay. Yeah. Now it's like, if somebody you know dies, that's a tragedy, which is good that that's true because yes. it means it's not as common, but it is a, a product of, I think, domesticating ourselves. So totally. that, that's something that's not supposed to happen anymore, but it used to happen all the time. Yeah, I mean, culture might just be adapting to those physical realities. One, that it's much later in our lives when we have to deal with the very adult experience of having someone we love or someone we know die. And also because of birth control and because of the job market being the way it is, we can wait till later and later to get jobs and to worry about some of the things that we used to like worry about right away. So it might just be sort of the culture being like, oh, well, we get to do this now. We get to kick back a little I bit I think longer. Being, uh, being empathetic and like chilling out and having a good time or even talking about science and art and philosophy, those are all luxuries that you only do once you've reached a very high level of stability. We would not be doing this podcast if we were worried about food, shelter, right. anything like that. You know? The podcast would be like, <laughs> we hear there's food down, at the <laughs> yeah. left, down on are, Main Street. Why are we broadcasting the location of the food? <laughs> yeah. Let's just go there now, man. <laughs> 
So a couple other things before we get to the white race. National cuisines are a thing that I assumed had like some real basis in deep history, like Italian food, that like if you went back to the Renaissance era Italy, you would see people stirring, you know, marinara sauce and flipping pizzas. And it turns out tomato sauce, the Spanish were the first ones to turn it into a sauce. And then it wasn't until Italians came to America that they became associated with having marinara sauce. And the Caesar salad was invented in Mexico by a Mexican chef. Mm -hmm. All these things that you associate with really specific cultural foods are just sort of abstractions that were invented. But what about the general schmear of a food concept? Like, I, I still feel that it's true that historically people originating in the geographical area we call Mexico cook a lot of cuisines with, like, chilies and pinto beans, right? Or is that even yeah, fake? No. Okay. But, but what we think <laughs> of, what we is Americans... Is nothing anything? <laughs> but I think there's still a point to that, because what we think as Americans of being Mexican food tends to be, like, tacos and burritos, and that isn't... Like, if you go to Mexico, there's, like... That's not the main thing. Right, it's there's not like authentic. and different types yes. of things. Yeah. But you know what I mean eat. when I say, but there's still a lot of ingredient crossover. So sure. I associate flavor profiles with certain yeah. countries, and I think that's... True. Or well, like, we pick our favorite, or like we pick random things from other cuisines and make that their banner, right. even though that tends to be like one small part. And of we it. almost always make it a fusion version of that thing. Yeah, right. And if we you went to that country, it, it wouldn't taste like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying there is no such thing as regional cuisines, just that America's understanding of regional cuisines is completely divorced from the reality, I guess. Like, and, have you been to yeah. Tijuana, man? They're just eating couscous and lobster. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chinese food is a good example. Uh, yeah, I was going to say yeah. Chinese is definitely the most... Because General Tao is in that article, and that's something I like didn't... I don't know if I've ever... I probably had it once in my life, but it's not something like I grew up eating. Yeah. And uh, when I think of like Chinese food, traditional dishes that come to mind, like from Taiwan, like beef noodle soup, that's a big one. And I've never heard that in America, like people craving like, oh, I'm craving Chinese food. Let's get some beef noodle soup. Right. Like, that's not a thing. People want, you know, orange chicken, general taos, yeah. whatever things you guys orange eat. Orange chicken <laughs> seems uniquely American to me. Is it? Or I think is so. there a it's version created of orange here. chicken in China? I want to say, so like I think fried rice or top suey is something that was created in America, but by Chinese Americans. So in a way, it has its own identity in like right. Asian American culture. Like pizza was invented by an Italian American in yeah. New York. So how do you, like, but, who do you But it was like, created for uh, <laughs> white people. Like right. I, I never ate chop suey growing up, but it was, there is history in it. Like it was created when Chinese immigrants, probably during the gold rush or something, sometime around then when they came over and they were making it for And I bet it's because it was cheap. Yeah. I bet it's the they same put as lobster. Yeah. They were exactly. using it to rip off idiots. <laughs> Here, just put some sugar on it and right, feed right, it right. to the... Yeah. You said it was yeah, for like, what it... people? I, I've never <laughs> heard of those. Well, no, make it the... oranger. <laughs> no, no, like bright neon <laughs> orange that wouldn't be in nature. That's what Americans <laughs> like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What else, guys? I have uh, two notes here. One says loving your children, and one <laughs> says romantic love. I'm just really oh, no. <laughs> But like... Uh, Those two concepts shouldn't go together. Well, I'll read this quote about loving your children, and I'm being tongue-in-cheek. Obviously, people love their children, but I think in the same way that it, it blows my mind whenever I stop and really think about how stinky history was, <laughs> like how you walked around in a cloud. Like the phrase stop and smell the roses probably meant like, because that's the only time it's like a magical little room mm. that doesn't smell like shit. Take a yeah. moment to not smell shit in your day. <laughs> so history was like terribly filthy and stinky, but also numb. I think there was an emotional numbness to the ancients that we don't take into account because life was so hard that it... So I'll just read this quote. Okay, well, I won't read the quote, but I'll direct you, I'll direct you to a highly regarded uh, paper on this issue called Did the Ancients Care When Their Children Died? <laughs> and basically, uh, what it lays out is just, it makes sense, but it's still mind-blowing to me, that when you can fully expect 50% of your kids to die, mm. you don't invest emotion in them. <laughs> That makes sense. And it led to, there's like way more widespread casual reference of what we would call gross negligence. People, you know, who say that they are an upstanding citizen who loves their family, but they leave their kid outside overnight because they forgot, oh, like one of the babies is outside, oh yeah. <sighs> or a kid dying of exposure is not unusual and you don't go to jail 
because kids die. Like you gave birth to them to help you with this horrible chore called life. If one of them dies farming, that's like part of the, you know. <laughs> so it's just interesting to me to think that either they literally were able to somehow not invest that emotion or ancient people had so many people around them die so frequently, so horribly that you're living in a world where everyone has PTSD. They're just numb. Like there is no one alive who we would not today diagnose with post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's interesting to think about, you tend to teleport back to history and be like, what would it be like? I just put my brain in the body of an ancient person. What would it be like? No, they felt things differently. They thought things differently. Like imagine really believing in the Greek gods yeah. and that they're like watching you right now. You would act totally differently. <laughs> the Greek gods aren't interesting too because when you when you talk about um, the relationship being different, I think about stories because a lot of times we can infer at least what values were in societies in the olden days through their stories and their myths. And Greek myths do have stories about like motherhood and like children. I'm trying to think of a specific, but I can't. But there's, <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of stories about, you know, caring about your kids and protecting them through throughout ancient history. But I wonder if it comes from more survival then. And maybe there were some exceptions where a mother really cared and then that's what made it to the story. Yeah. Well, speaking of ancient Rome, the one quote I, was, I did have is uh, Seneca wrote like a piece that where that they paraphrase in this uh, article explaining the rules of grief because in Roman mm -hmm. society it was important to like, you know, everything abided by, like Jack was saying, the cultural traditions and that's what keeps us strong. And there's a passage that's like, do not grieve overly for the death of a child. It's unseemly. Like, don't cry too much in public. It's, it's not a good look. <laughs> it's considered, it was considered culturally weak. The proper thing to do was to avoid excessive display of emotion and only display emotion proportional to the loss. Remember, this is a young person. Mm -hmm. You have not lost much. Wow. So it really was, the, people had it driven home to them. And I don't think it's callousness. I think it's because life was so hard. Oh, well, it was just a kid. At least they didn't have a full life before they died. And now it's so funny that we would think just it's the like opposite. Yeah. yeah, We're like, it was just a kid. No. <laughs> right. No, I thought of one in the Trojan War before they go off to war. The They want to sacrifice, I forget, it starts with an I. The, the young teenage uh, girl. If, Iphigenia. Iphigenia. And then the mother is very upset about that. Yeah, so exactly. There sort of a so there's a, and there's definitely, Wait, they go. Is this, oh, this is a Greek before, god oh, Greek, story. Well, before they go to war in the, um. I think it's Iliad. in the Iliad, yeah. yeah. Is it Agamemnon? I think Agamemnon his, he wants to or, sacrifice his daughter yeah. so that they have a safe journey. And yes, the wife and, that's and not, mother yeah. gets very angry and upset. And that's why she has revenge on him later. Right. That's what I was going to so say. Like when a, you were saying uh, that like the person who's like, you guys, chill, chill out. out. It was just a kid. Yeah. That was clearly a man who didn't have to physically fucking push that kid through his body. Birth because <laughs> right. like that's such a physically taxing, just like horrifying thing to have to go through. And like also like feed them with your body. Of you course, become genetically, so and I'm not there's a bond genetically of course. with them. Yeah. And there's all the oxytocin stuff. Yeah. So like, I'm not saying the parent that it wasn't sad at all when your kid died, but no, I am I saying it's so interesting to think about how most people how had to deal with right. four kids dying. Yeah, that's true. And like that would change everything about how you walk around feeling all the time. On the Greek <laughs> gods thing, when we spoke to Reza Aslan a couple uh, weeks back, he was saying that he's this religion expert. I don't know if you guys yeah, know yeah, him. Know. But uh, he was saying that our current understanding of believing the things in the Bible are true and believing there's a God up there, like looking down at us, that's actually a recent thing. So the way that we yeah, misunderstand you'd think as you go them, back in time, it would get more literal. Right, but, but it, it becomes, <laughs> like he was saying that if you went back in time and asked people, so do you believe that there was a person named Adam and a person named Eve and God came down and spoke to them? They would be like, what the fuck does that even mean? What What are you talking about? How could how could it be true? Like, just it's allegories. just a myth. It's just an allegory yeah. to, like, a way of understanding. Now, as an honored guest, would you like to sleep with one of my daughters? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, exactly. They still had issues. Right. <laughs> Uh, and along the same lines, I briefly wanted to mention romantic love and the concept that the feeling of infatuation, the feeling of, uh, and it's interesting, there was this whole thesis paper I went through that was a great read. They did a massive study trying to identify what is romantic love versus a functional relationship between what two people. What is love, Michael? <laughs> well, it has, they ended with, there's apparently like 82 
aspects. But the major ones are things like A, romantic love arises from pre-existing yearnings. D, romantic love is often one-sided. G, romantic oh, no. love is always a fantasy in that a prefabricated emotion is projected onto another. And I like this X, romantic love is temporary, lasting no less than 18 months and no more than three years. So, like, they boiled it down to a <laughs> science by measuring oxytocin levels and stuff like that. But one of the conclusions they came to that I'll just read that I was really interesting by looking at ancient sources is... Before the 12th century, in Europe at least, love between men and women was not regarded as positive or heroic. It was considered a sign of weakness, the preoccupation of a person without character. So, like, you shouldn't be interested in impressing women. You should be homoerotically yeah. chumming it up with all your dude friends, you know, being honorable and, like, blah, blah, blah. When you have to have a kid... You engage in an exchange of property and get a woman and have a kid. But there was, just like the ad campaigns we're talking about, someone basically invented the genre of like a romance novel. You know, the first iteration of a book that was focused on romantic love being good and something to like fall into and love. And then there was just a whole spate of romance novels and it culturally flipped to like... Wasn't it Lancelot and Guinevere? Or... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, the story of Lancelot saying... and Guinevere. Yeah, yeah. that's one like... of the first instances of them taking a national iconic hero and saying, well, he felt <laughs> love for a woman and he ain't no sissy. Right. And people were like, oh, it's kind of cool to like be in love it, with someone. It's all these <laughs> stories. I wonder because I'm sure historically like people who are drawn to writing and creating stories are still of the creative type. So maybe the majority of societies weren't like that. But the stories that live on, you know, the love stories, like in Greek myths, there's plenty of love stories. And a lot of those get passed on because the people who are like that are the ones telling the stories. And in hindsight, we look back and we're like, these are the norms of the world. Well, the ones that don't resonate get lost to history, right? Like, for all we know, there may be a bunch of Greek (laughs) myths about how falling in love immediately meets with, like, judgment because it's a weak thing to do. We didn't, like, pass those ones down. They're not collected. Well, a lot of them are warnings. I'm not saying they definitely are. A lot of them are warnings, but we think of them as love stories. Like, Pygmalion, he turns into stone, right? I mean, they're not, they don't really end in a happy way. The one of Hades, when he looks... Pomegranate. Yeah, yeah, Persephone. 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 That's interesting, He looks back. And and turns into a pill of salt. And we always think, like, that's, or that's Lot's wife, sorry. Yeah, well, no, no, but we think of, well, he gets stuck in Hades, right? But it's interesting, we always think of those stories as oh it's sad because of that because love didn't triumph but they probably read it and interpreted it as like a horror movie where the see? people yeah. have sex like, games yeah. Yeah. see yeah. don't fall in love you sissy don't look back at your wife yeah. right. <laughs> that's what you get it's interesting because so much of relationships were not based on romantic love so it seems almost like it, in the same way that like parents having kids who die young is self-perpetuating because they care less for their kids and pay less attention, so their kids are more likely to die, yeah. so they're more li- less likely to pay it attention to the kids. It takes a long time to fix right. that, yeah. I feel like the same thing would happen with romantic love and not feeling romantic love or not associating it with good things because, you know, you're having these, like, arranged marriages, mm. so if that is your ideal, then I'm sure there's, like, loads of infidelity like nobody's right. gonna right. stay nobody's gonna well, be faithful to a spouse who like they just like were forced to marry because if like, you're imbibing a bunch of stories about romantic love right right but if well, your culture supports like working towards the greater good yeah I, th- I feel like even then there were people who had i think they called it right. having bowels for one, uh, <laughs> right, one like, another well, of course wasn't there were choice, people right? who were obsessed it, with a yeah. person right. you have to look at the value of everything there, we put value in romantic love because now we have the choice supposedly like we we're trying to pick our perfect love so there's this value in this dating part of your life you know so you want to find romantic love but right. back then if you're just arranged even if you found romantic love it wouldn't change anything because everything was arranged so it's sort of like there's not really time put into finding romantic love if no matter what, you're going to end up in this arranged marriage. It's just a hindrance. But I also... Yeah. 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 So then, like, you don't marry for love and therefore you look on it badly because it's getting in the way of your life of being married for property. Well, maybe I should have been an ancient person, but I'll (laughs) disagree and say that I think it's super harmful that most of our stories fetishize that concept of romantic love, which I really do believe is just like an early phase in the relationship of heightened chemicals in your body. And when it goes away, uh, so many people think like, aren't I supposed to be feeling this thing that I saw Uh depicted in every movie and every song I've ever heard? And I'll just say as a young person, it fucked me up. I had like weird standards 
dating, I was like, I think I'm supposed to feel this much, though, right. because of the movie right. Clueless or whatever. <laughs> right. yeah. I think I'm supposed to feel high on cocaine all the time. Like, it wouldn't be because... that bad if we taught young people that part of whether the relationship lives happily ever after is that they were like a good match with shared values. Yeah. Right. That would be a good lesson in a romance movie. Right. But Willing it's never that. Sacrifices. It's like they finally reached the object of their obsession. Yeah. We're done. It's right. kind of like the, even the idea of teenagers we talked about earlier. It's like it's heightened in this movie world. And so we think that's what it's supposed to be. So many movies disproportionately are about teenagers. And that's such a short period of your life. Like you're an adult much longer than you're a teenager. But we get stuck in like fetishizing that era of our lives. And maybe love is like that too. Sure, yeah. it's a great thing to be in those two to three years of like hopeless Right. in love but that's not most of your life but now we're imagining that's what it's supposed to be all the time because of movies I think people do I did and for mm -hmm. a while like till I figured it out the white people think it's very interesting to me yeah me too that they didn't exist or don't exist <laughs> but myth. somehow they own everything <laughs> yeah sort of one interesting thing that I, I hadn't realized is that the human genome project where they're decoding the human genome and are able to actually see the information that makes up who we are as people has found that there's actually more genetic variants in a flock of pigeons than there is between different races in humans. And in fact, there's more genetic variants oftentimes between someone who would be described in America as white and another person who would be described as white and someone who would be described as white and someone who would be described as black. There's a right. lot bigger differences. There is, if you understand statistical importance, <laughs> you <laughs> just need to understand there has never been found any single gene or cluster of genes or pattern of genes that correlates in any meaningful way to anyone's regional ethnicity or skin color. Like, other than, I guess, technically, the genes that control how much melanin is in your skin affect your skin color, <laughs> right. correlate yeah. to skin color. But you know what I mean. Yeah. There's, like right. you just said, there's no... I love, you can just type it into Google, like, why is racism false? And that pops up. <laughs> it's like, there has never been found an opera, a genetic operand yeah. that correlates to skin color. <laughs> but so I had kind of always known that in the future, we're going to look back on this time period and be like, man, they were really obsessed with race and racist. I didn't realize that if you looked forward from most cultures throughout history, they would also be like, man, they're, they're really obsessed, obsessed with race and kind of racist color, yeah. in America in particular. But yeah, when you go back to like the ancient Greeks, they thought that they were the superior culture to the cultures that surrounded them. But they thought it was completely cultural. You know, they were like, because we have these great traditions. And they thought the most barbaric people in their general vicinity were the extremely white people to the but north. But not because they were extremely white. But not because they were extremely white. They literally white. like, and it's funny because it's a double-sided coin because obviously the things they were doing to the people that they oppressed, way more brutal than some of the stuff we're right. doing now. But it's a much more reasonable assumption if you're going to be a supremacist for your culture. They are like, because of our systems and institutions, right. we're the supreme culture. Not just because I'm on this Pantone scale of like the color right. chart. Yeah. Right. They just generally assumed that were just people like, were people. If you don't live here and didn't go to my school, you're a barbarian heathen. Yeah. Right. And well, yeah, like Asian people are the white people of Asia too. We in America see them as other. But if you're from China, like there's right. all this history in China. They, they're, they're the standard there. So yes, it's, it's interesting. but that's the whole I thing I think we're trying to navigate and undermine also is Saying whiteness is the same oh, sure, as the sure. standard is a myth. There's no. <laughs> I'm still using what I've been trained. Oh, and I'm not accusing you. We all reference. do that. But I mean, like, that's the point. Whiteness, even by uh, by granting its existence, it's as if you're saying, I somehow identify myself with a team of people of all anyone in Europe or Africa or Asia who happens to be in the color range of my skin. I think that's a valid categorical system, and it's not at all. There's no, like, basis for categorizing anything that way. And in our article, we talk about how, like, people who would be identified as white now, most notably the Irish in America, were thought the lowest class. And Italians, too. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah Irish and Italians. And again, it wasn't about skin color. And then there was, I mean, more research I did sort of talks about the theory that 
Irish Americans, by participating in racist cultural norms, were able to elevate themselves. Like yeah. it, you know what I mean? It's like, like the new immigrants come in and then they, they move up. They get shit then, on, yeah. so they say, no, 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 we should shit. We should all get together and shit on the people who look don't look like us. And as an, as an ad campaign or a meme, that worked. And it's yeah. like, okay, Irish people are white now, I guess. Right. It's just a feeling of other. When I was a kid, I spoke Chinese before I went to school, and, and there's like a phrase in Chinese, Wai Goren, which just literally translates to foreigners. But my mom would say that in terms of like, oh, people who aren't Chinese. If she says, you know, like, oh, you're going to go to school and meet Wai Goren, like blah, blah, blah. And in my mind, I categorize everybody who wasn't Chinese as Wai Goren, including black people, white people, Hispanic people. So for a while, like the category in my mind when I thought of white person was like included black people, Hispanic people. Right. Yeah. And oh, they didn't really just, there wasn't a line differentiated. Yeah, it just yeah. meant literally somebody who isn't Chinese and doesn't speak Chinese, you know, so doesn't speak your language, like whatever. And, and that's, that's, used, yeah. that's how like 90 percent of history worked mm -hmm. it was like well so we have our culture and then there are like all these other people and they're like yeah. not physically different so the idea that there were these like physical differences between different races is like a a uniquely american obsession and the races can be categorized by taking a an eyedropper sample of the color of your skin yeah. right <laughs> exactly I, I was listening to this podcast from duke's documentary project. I, I forget, I'll put it in the footnotes, but really good like four part thing about just like the history of white people essentially. And he asked this professor, do we have an idea of like when race was invented or like who invented it just generally like a century? Yeah. And he was like, oh yeah, it was this guy in 1443. <laughs> and <laughs> just in time to influence Columbus. Good job. Exactly. It, it was a, I think a Dutch Prince, Prince Henry, had just gone to Africa and gotten a bunch of slaves from Africa. And he commissioned a guy to write about that story and claim that the people who they had enslaved were different physically different and basically he commissioned He's someone just to looking come up for with, a way to make it okay that's all yeah that, that's exactly <laughs> right and so that's the point to emphasize there is that first comes the slavery and like the idea that well it's convenient for me to deprive these people of their rights because then i can you know use them for labor and make right. a shitload of money and i can because i have weapons and shit they don't have just by chance right? and <laughs> therefore let's come up with this pseudoscience called race. And so that's the first time it came up. But it wasn't very popular in Western Europe, or at least it wasn't nearly as popular in Western Europe as it was in America for the exact reason that America was using slave labor more than Western Europe. And so it just really follows slavery around. And that's why it's a uniquely American and uniquely 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th century American ideal is because America was using black slave labor and they needed some justification for building their country with this like horribly immoral form of labor and, you know, form of exploitation. And so this became like imprinted in America's intellectual history. Ralph Waldo Emerson has like this book called English Traits that they don't mm. teach you in oh, school. No. And it's just a white supremacist text. It's like all about how right. like yes. English people are superior. And in one of his more famous texts, he's like anti-slavery. But his explanation in this is like, because it's not good for us to like oh, no. have to deal with the guilt of doing that. And like they, they are an But even people. saying guilt is interesting. Yeah. It implies that he knows it's uh, immoral, obviously. Or, on he says level. barbaric. It's too barbaric oh, okay. for the uh, for the American. It's an uncivilized form but of But they're still oppression. implying, like, oh, we're better because we know better. But he and, still... and it wasn't even implied. He says in this text that nobody, re nobody reads, he says that black people are a lesser species of human. And this is where it becomes really popular. There were all these books that claimed that, you know, black people had more in common with apes and gorillas than they did with humans, which now that we know the science, like I said, they're is like absolutely no difference you, between white people and black people, genetically speaking. You shouldn't even need to say right. it. Yeah. Fuck this country. Right. But, <laughs> but so an interesting thing, I had always thought of 
eugenics and the Holocaust, the whole Nazi thing, and like that ideology as being something that was like somewhat stylish in America at the time of Nazism, but that it was like mainly Nazis who were like forwarding oh, yeah. that ideal. But like America was the place where that gained. Yeah, foot. They Ford and Lindbergh Nazi. were promoting. Yeah. Both were promoting we, Hitler's ideas before he went too far. But and, we, but, like, but we influenced like not uh, Hitler was inspired by reading about American eugenics. And the it whole wasn't idea like of... Right, time. American... There were American was asshole racists writing the thoughts yeah. that he would later go like, no, but I we like did, that we idea. We did stuff. It's, we like would capture people and uh, sterilize yeah. gay people, um, handicapped people. It was a whole thing that we don't teach in right. schools. Yeah. And I we mean, did that before. It sort of led Hitler to believe like, oh, it's not just me that has this crazy urge. It's time in the world for this mm -hmm. genocide shit right. to happen. It makes a sort of sense because America is this crazy experiment where it's the first place where a country was started that wasn't built on and by people who had lived in that land for thousands and thousands of years. So the ruling class there need to come up with this fake science to claim, oh, well, we're inherently superior because they can't claim right. the right. Greeks that like, oh, well, we just have a better culture or whatever. Right. And so the one nuance and disclaimer I told myself I had to say in this section <laughs> is <laughs> by saying race is a fake construct, we're not saying, and I don't want to give people the ammunition to say to themselves, you know, like it's the same as like, oh, I'm colorblind, so I can stop thinking about the strife of black Americans. Race is real in so far as, like you were saying, like we've uh, given Teresa, it power. diamonds are yeah. really valuable because we make. So this isn't to say that just the opposite, that racial strife and people of color go through like unique struggles. Exactly. But we're saying it comes after the fact yeah. The slavery existed as an economic convenience. And then the culture finds a way to rationalize it to itself. Yes. One of my favorite sentences that just explains or like how absurd it is, is or how uh, race is an empty concept from any scientific standpoint is if you try to give race a biological foundation, it only leads to absurdities, as in the common example that a white woman can give birth to a black child, but a black woman could never give birth to a white child. Okay, so uh, I want to stop here and make sure you get what Michael is saying, because I didn't get this idea the first time I heard it, but it's a horrible racist idea that I totally had hiding away in my brain without realizing it. So a white woman can have a black baby. Think President Obama. His mom was a white lady. She gave birth to the first black president. Now try to picture it going the other way. My male white friend is married to my female black friend, and they had an adorable child, and that child happens to be extremely fair and have, like, feathery blonde hair. But that child, as far as I was concerned, is black or, you know, mixed. But I never would have said he was white. Why? He looks completely white, and he's half white, but based on the logic that... I grew up on, my mind wouldn't make room for calling him white. Uh, and I think that's literally because of that racist as fuck one drop rule, which I don't know if we covered, but was an idea started by slave owners to prevent race mixing that stated that if someone had one drop of black blood in them, like one black great grandparent, they were to be considered black. Uh, and somehow that wound its way through history into my brain. And yeah, the fact that race logic makes room for a white woman giving birth to uh, the first black president, but couldn't make room for my black friend giving birth to a white person proves that the idea of white person is bullshit. It's an invented concept someone made up that plays by arbitrary rules. Science doesn't work like that. Science doesn't have one drop rules. That's culture. Anyways, uh, hopefully everyone mixes together until we have Nice, light brown children. My son, who is half Korean, half whatever mixture of Irish, Scotch, Spanish, Black Irish I am. I don't give a shit. But he looks almost exactly like our friend's son, whose parents were both born in Mexico. Uh, hopefully we mix until this bizarre ancient pseudoscience no longer makes sense. And we have to show charts to future generations to explain how wrong we were and what we were even wrong about. All right, back to the rest of the episode. And that's and that highlights yeah. so concretely, you're like, 
Yep, it's fake. It's a uh, it's a fake arbitrary sorting system. Yeah, the, think it about can't it, be though. right. But it's so transparently well, it's arbitrary... makes clear the function of race. It's like an yeah. arbitrary. Yeah, you're right because it's an arbitrary belief that like white equals pure. So yeah. anything exactly. that's not white touching like white blood makes it not white, which is not true. Because every I mean, if we're gonna go by the idea of like not racist, but you know genetics, like you know if a black person marries a white person. You're both 100% black and you're both 100% white. That's how that should work. Right. But instead, with the arbitrary pseudoscience, right. they teach like, oh, well, in, if you're white and anything comes in that's not white, right. you're therefore not and white. And that's what's so funny is I don't even understand what it means. And people, like I have an uncle who's obsessed with genealogy who just sent me this ridiculous pie chart that he spent years and lots of money assembling that explains that I'm like 1.8% Dutch, 5.9% Irish. And I'm like... How can that be true or accurate? Because no one came and took my blood. Like, it's not a genetic. It's just looking at records. Right. And I'm like, but everyone was an amoeba. Right. And yeah. all, even if you just go back to Homo sapiens, we were all in the geographical area we now call Africa and then migrated out. What does it mean to say you're 5% <laughs> Cherokee or whatever? It doesn't. Right. What it, it, it means as much only insofar as you invest in it. If you're connected to those cultural roots, great. Of whatever, you know, but like... I just look at that pie chart and I'm like, that's nonsense. I'm an amoeba, like descended from like a never ending line of just flesh of every color. <laughs> and just in terms of the white race in particular, that's a extremely sliding and shifting idea that, you know, like we said, Italians, like if you look at the racist political cartoons, which were like all political cartoons in the early 20th century, they draw Italians as these like black, colored in, like, Swarty, black yeah. apes. And it's offensive like, in exactly the same way that cartoons about black people were offensive. Right, so exactly. Like, yeah, they They're, were categorized. They are, those are Italians, they're in there. And then I feel like in my lifetime, I've witnessed friends of mine who are, you know, Iraqi or Lebanese, I've witnessed them sort of go from being white people, like, in the 80s, when, you know, sure. we didn't have wars in that part of the world to once Operation Desert Storm happened, my friend who was an Iraqi, suddenly they started talking about him like he was of a different race. So it's like you just suddenly took this group of people and like moved them outside of white people just because yeah. it was like convenient for you. And And now when you hear people talk about like racial profiling, they'll talk about stopping a person from the Middle East because they're supposedly now of a different race, even though when I was born, they were just considered white people just as much as, you know, an Italian or an Irish person. Yeah, it's almost like white is just means the privileged class in our society, right? not necessarily skin color. Fuck. <laughs> um, yeah. A really good quote that I heard about it is, the fortunate man is seldom satisfied with merely being fortunate. He needs to know that he had a right to be fortunate. He wants to be convinced that he deserves it, and above all, that he deserves it when compared with other people. Good fortune thus wants to be legitimate fortune. And I think that mm -hmm. explains why race has been such an obsession for specifically white people. And we're not saying that race isn't a reality now, just that it was invented. Yeah, my, girl, my girlfriend, can... who's very good on these issues, just warned me. She's like, don't go giving out information so that it, like a bunch of borderline racist people can go, oh, racism's over. They said it's fake. They said whiteness doesn't <laughs> exist. I'm off the hook. No. That's not what we're saying. The fact that we're, <laughs> the fact that we're having to like say this with such surprise in our voice yeah. means that it's still a thing. And the fact that based on what in America is considered race, you can predict how well someone is likely to succeed financially, how likely they are to end up in jail, how long their life is going to be better than where they're born or like, you know, how much money their parents have at birth. Yeah. Yeah. Race determines that because it's such a big deal in America. We're just saying that it is a wholly American construction, but it's one that America's obsessed with more than anything else, even right. to this yeah. day. And it's in 2000 years, if and when we do work this shit out, people, like you said, will look back and not understand why race mm -hmm. was a category that we even cared about. Like, why is that an attribute you're tracking? Yeah. Race is not... 
it's, I hope not going to be like a cogent concept anymore. It's just someday. like a very manipulative, like it exists now because we've given it that power, but it uh, was manipulative when it was created. It's like saying like if, uh, I don't know, like if you're in a relationship and a, a guy is like abusive and pretends to cheat or just plays mm-hmm. mind games so that you feel like insecure and then you accuse them of cheating and then they let's say they didn't actually cheat but they purposefully you know slipped in right, notes exactly, and, yeah. and left lipstick stains just to freak you out and then you freak out and accuse them then they can say like well i never cheated didn't exist it's like well you still did the thing and now yeah, we have to deal with exist. Yeah, yeah and you st- the effects that it had on you are still there like of the psychological effects in the mind games. Absolutely, yeah. So it's sort of like, you can't just be like, well, now nothing matters, and let's just go back to before. We can't just go back. We have to deal with yeah. what we've done. It's interesting. I think even people with their hearts very much in the right place have gone through an up and down. Because there's like a period where, quote unquote, enlightened people who are perceived as white would say like, okay, so the goal is to say I don't see color. And I think now there's a more nuanced understanding where it's like, no, that's bullshit too. Because that's... Uh, Basically dismissing or negating yeah. the reality of this That's thing that does affect all these the people. That's ignoring the whole, the entire right. Right. problem. So, uh, so, Race yeah. is real in the sense that we made it real. And, like, it's, and, and you it's, can predict how well people are going to do in life because of institutional racism. And I don't think there's any one right way to get out of this pickle we're in. So it's a tough road to hoe. But I think I do. Being <laughs> open to discussing and also I think the really important thing I've noticed in the recent months is just being able to be uncomfortable with it like having those difficult conversations Mm -hmm. the colorblind statement comes from this place where it's like my heart is in the right place and I want it to be okay let's just skip ahead to the place where it is okay and validate me that you know my heart's in the right place well that's nice but that's not what's important right now yeah Yeah. but I think it's okay yeah it's (laughs) okay to be like oh I was wrong in saying this that doesn't mean you're racist against white people just because you know because that's the thing I hear if I if I try to tell somebody oh I actually think this is offensive then people will say like oh well that's you don't know that I'm you know I'm a good person so it's sort of being able to be uncomfortable and have those conversations so that we can get to the place where there is no race but we're not there yet because like the people who are overtly racist are not going to change 99% 99% of them just have mm-hmm. to die but of old age. <laughs> of old age, I'm not making or a threat. Or of their own hate, no. And, and then, like, the next generation will come up. But I do see the biggest roadblock among white people in this country right now on this issue is people who would vote all the right ways and think all the right things but are incredibly defensive about getting into the topic because it's, yeah, there's a defensiveness. Racism is one of the... Worst things you can be called if you really understand how horrible it is. Mm-hmm. So you leap to this defensive s- stance that is just like the white person asking for comfort, like, please tell me I'm not racist, is so not helpful and counterproductive. <laughs> it's not what we need to be doing. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really good way of putting it, Teresa, that it's like jumping forward, just wanting to like jump forward to it being over, but not like actually dealing with the underlying issues. Yeah, I, w- I want to think that it's going away or that we're becoming more enlightened, but we keep talking on our editorial calls about how YouTube stars keep coming out as, like, white supremacists. These are people who have more fans than Jerry Seinfeld had right. when I was a kid. Teenagers are more into YouTube celebrities whose names I've never right. heard mm. than I was into all the different members of the Wu-Tang Clan. Sure. And I was obsessed with the fucking Wu-Tang Clan. I don't know about multiple, but obviously I know about the PewDiePie one because I was so high profile. And I'll say, I don't think it is coming out as a white supremacist. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Oh, I know. Okay. But there, there's I, a guy who came out and was like, hey, sure, it's I'm a true, men's right white supremacist. Wow. Oh, well, Follow it's me. still worth noting, I think, that PewDiePie and other people, there's a... And this is the pendulum of history, and it's tough, and I just hope we get through. As time goes forward, a lot of people seem to get more empathetic and more understanding. But also, we get further and further from horrible shit that reminded us not to do that. And so it it loses its power. Mm -hmm. Like PewDiePie put the swastika and stuff in his videos or had someone hold up a sign that says, I hate Jews or something. And uh, he probably thought it was just funny because it was so provocative because it's the worst thing you could do. I get it. But like the real offensiveness and how fucking stupid and not worth the joke that was is lost on him because he's whatever, nine years old. He doesn't remember the Holocaust. You know what I mean? Like, and he doesn't even, his parents and his family, you know, probably. So it's weird. The further you get from these horrible tragedies, you like to think like we learn history so we won't repeat it. 
But that's, mm-hmm. I don't know. We learn history so you see what we'll repeat. It's like, Because uh, we repeat it a lot. It's like making fun of, like, the Mayans disappearing now. To him, he probably thinks, oh, we're so far because it's so in our culture now that we all agree it's a bad thing. But he is just young enough where he isn't really grasping why like right, he's a exactly. couple steps beyond it and he thinks that we're just in that space. At the same time, I mean, black soccer players get bananas thrown at them and and he's mm. a European guy. Like he he's aware that there's racism in the world still. It's not I, Yeah, I'm not I don't excusing think his behavior. I'm no, just no, saying, I know, but, but, I'm just but it's, a, understand it's a weird it. space yeah. we're in where I think it's like I just think kids are more at risk I think it's for not more indefensible the than, horror of history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for yeah. sure. So that's one kind of myth that I hadn't been familiar with is that basically the 20th century was the time of peak racism. We're very close to the time of peak racism. The Holocaust was like the peak of this pseudoscience of this idea of race. Can I ask just, sorry, do you know anything about like, because Shakespeare plays Mm -hmm. have race, famously racist depictions in them. Anti-Semitic. And and anti-Semitic. So, uh, well, people have always been uh, culturalists. They're always sharing right. each other's cultures. But I'm talking literally about, like, Titus Andronicus, where the guy's like, my heart is as black as my skin because I'm a Moor and all Moors were born in sin. So, like, that seems to me to be directly like your skin color makes you inferior. Is I don't that... know. Okay. I want to look into yeah, that. Yeah, well, I wonder because... It, but Othello like, is black and Othello's is the hero. Othello is black. Yeah. He's, well, he, but he murders his wife. That's true. And he's a tragic hero. He is a tragic hero, but I would say Othello is not like an offensive stereotype, at least, whereas the guy from Titus Andronicus He's totally a little bit of is. a warning, though, I think, in, yeah. if you examine the play. Maybe. But I wonder, because you say that we're in the peak era of racism, but I also think if you trace back far enough, a lot of cultures are very much sticking to themselves, too. So maybe it's hard to say now if they had been as like a melting pot as America is now, right. would they have been racist or would they have been very open to just, just defining it by skin color is what i'm interested in and i want because it seems like shakespeare did at least for or was aware but, of the trope of right. skin color based racism but they weren't just like more cultures were not interacting with each other because That's travel true. wasn't as easy like yeah. asian people for a long time were just sticking to themselves in asia and they weren't interacting with african I see. people so you're saying you know? for it to be the peak of racism well, I'm saying it's hard to say people have to be people together were more accepting back then yeah. because they weren't Right. Given the chance to accept. So I don't know. Right. Maybe they would have been, but Shakespeare it's hard might have to say. been writing that having never met a more person or, you know. <laughs> right. And specifically using them because they're like a crazy exotic person. Like it's a far away far idea away that only yeah. explorers right. come back with stories right. about. So of course it feels exotic. We always think of the founding fathers being slave owners and racists as being, oh, but they were of their time. And like I didn't realize Jefferson was not of his time. People, when Thomas Jefferson was around, were like, dude, you're really racist. He would like get mail from Western Europe being like, you're wrong about African people. Like, they're not worse people. I have lots of African friends over here in Europe. He wrote this uh, really famous piece of nonfiction where he like laid out his views. It's something like views from Virginia or on, on Virginia or something, but he sort of laid out his views on slavery and race and and he's a saxon supremacist which people call people wasps that stands for white anglo-saxon protestant but over in england where the saxons are from they don't even know what a saxon is like that's an uh, american obsession thomas jefferson was like one of the most racist people alive at his time, and it's his ideas. Like him having a best-selling piece of nonfiction where he spread racism, that is a big thing that helped racism take off. And isn't it funny how there's never once been a race supremacist who somehow discovered that not their race is the supreme race? (laughs) Like, I want to see the one person who was like, oh, shit, I found out the Lakota (laughs) Indians are the supreme people. I'm going to kill myself. (laughs) <laughs> there are writings of people being like, I just met the first native from this new world. And I believe they, they are, are the supreme the, people. They are uh, the most beautiful creatures I've ever seen. They're six foot that's three. True, yeah. they're, they have like this really noble way about there them. There was a lot written They about. smell good. But they still like exotify them. I feel like they're still, because I know white people is a, is a construct, but the idea of like what we traditionally think of historically as white people, a lot of them were explorers. So I think there's this feeling of like, I'm going to go to a new land and see what resources I can get. And even when you glorify the native, 
creatives, there's still a feeling of like, well, I, I discovered them. So of course you want it to be. Yeah. Awesome, so it's on me. It is, I'm yeah. cool. Like it's still, I'm taking credit for discovering this cool group of people who are living just happily and <laughs> yeah. whatever. Um, and then it still comes back as like this exotic fetish Legend, kind of thing right. of like, no, they're savage. great. There's yeah. Atlantis, a lot of gold, yeah. but it's like for me, what can it do for me? You know, but I do think there was that difference in bearing because one of my favorite quotes that I'll paraphrase was from a Native American chief at that time who said, uh, like an Englishman asked him what they thought English people looked like mm. from their perspective. And they were like, you all look very, very worried all the time, <laughs> constantly scanning the horizon as if danger is approaching. And we always wonder what you're, wait, like, what you're looking for, what dread you think is approaching. <laughs> I'm like, that's very interesting, interesting. that that's so the trope of that white people I for am them. English. <laughs> According to yeah. that description. Modern anxiety. You're white. <laughs> and as you alluded to, Atlantis, that's an indication that uh, a lot of these white, quote, explorers were just liars. <laughs> like, <laughs> they just were like, yeah, I went and saw and they uh, have mouths on the back of their heads and like right. they yeah. <laughs> one-legged tall women who are as tall as the trees. and. <laughs> And I did, just to answer the question, find a little blurb on the Shakespeare thing, basically saying that he probably made their skin black because they're a Moor, and he probably treated them unfairly because he's a cultural supremacist, but he probably didn't think that just because you have black skin, right, you know what I mean? Yeah. So right. like it's still, It was right. like an outsider thing, not like specifically He skin used him color. as an outsider, and he made it factually accurate that someone from Africa has black skin, so it's mentioned in the play. And he was still a supremacist for his own culture and treated other cultures right. poorly, but he didn't have our idea that the skin is the thing. Right. The skin is why it is that If way. there was a Moor yeah. who had been born and raised In next Genoa. door to Shakespeare, he would not have been like, I'm superior to you. Exactly. Because, yeah, yeah. He, he, <laughs> it was all cultural for the most part before America. And speaking of Shakespeare, just a, a weird one that I forgot to hit earlier is authorship is fairly recent. Like the idea that there's a single person who writes a thing and then that person has some ownership over that thing. That's a fairly recent idea. And they think, for instance, that Homer might have been an entire generation of poets. All named Homer. Like a collective. Right. Through sheer Yeah, chance. just a collective. Or many generations who like sort of honed this story and that just got uh, lumped it into It actually stands for a huge organization of men engaged in repetition. <laughs> oh my repeat. God, that was pretty impressive, man. <laughs> man. <laughs> Mic drop. Long years of having to come up with a SWAM acronym for every episode of Does Not Compute has given me an uncanny ability to make acronyms. But that was, that, was, yeah. that was perfect. All your SWAM ones are nonsense. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> All right, that'll do it for this week. Thanks to Teresa Lee and my occasional co-host, Michael Swaim. Hope you enjoyed it. On to some brief footnotes. We're going to link off to that cracked article called Seven Concepts We Totally Take for Granted, like white people, uh, an article called Man-Made Things You Totally Thought Were Natural. We'll link off to one called Simple Things You Won't Believe Are Recent Inventions. We'll link to a Seeker article called Cows Almost Impossible to Domesticate DNA Reveals, uh, basically about the very strange domestication process that cows underwent. They're all descended from like 4,000 female cows in Iran like 10,000 years ago. Uh, we'll link off to the Pacific Standard article, How Lobster Got Fancy, and the amazing Gawker article, RIP Gawker, called Breathtaking Document Reveals Pepsi's Logo is Pinnacle of Entire Universe. It's those leaked Pepsi logo design documents that I mentioned. We'll link off to a Time article uh, about the life article that we talked about, the invention of teenagers, a New York Times piece called Who's White? That podcast from Duke University Center for Documentary Studies called Seeing White that I mentioned, very good. Uh, we're going to link off to Ralph Waldo Emerson's English Traits, which if you want to get your blood good and angered up, worth a read. The Atlantic's article called Thomas Jefferson, Radical and Racist. A scholarly article called Did the Ancients Care When Their Children Died? And finally, the Romantic Love Test, which, yeah, it's like one of those Cosmo quizzes, but supposedly scientific. 
Uh, I have not taken it yet, but I'm confident in the strength of my relationship with Engineer Brett, who I'd like to thank for putting this episode together. As always, you can follow him at Brett, R-A-D-E-R. You can follow me at Jack underscore O-B-R-I-E-N. And we'll be back next week with more podcast. Talk to you then. Hey, this is Hillary Frank. I host the Longest Shortest Time podcast. Tune in next week for a very special interview with comedian Rob Hubel. We will talk about his wife. Oh boy, Hillary, don't make me start crying. Uh, becoming a dad. Hold on, I gotta pour. I gotta pour myself some water so I don't cry on your podcast. And bringing his daughter home. I gotta take a sip of this water, which I wish was vodka, but it's water. Mm to keep myself from crying like a big crybaby. Rob Hubel, like you have never heard him before. Next week on The Longest Shortest Time. Fuck you, Hillary. <laughs> Fuck you. Just doing my job. This has been an Earwolf production. Executive produced by Scott Ackerman, Chris Bannon, and Colin Anderson. For more information and content, visit Earwolf.com. Earwolf.com.